Well, welcome to episode 55 of 10 Minute Record Reviews. This time we're going to talk about Ornette Coleman's classic album from 1960 on Atlantic, Change of the Century. And uh, this is the first UK pressing which came out a year later in 1961. So what to expect from this album? This is Ornette Coleman, and so of course he's arguably the founder of free jazz, of the new thing, along with other people obviously who, who made their own major contributions. But having said that, and while there is free jazz on this album, this is still relatively accessible compared to some of the work he would do in the, in the relatively near future, really, in the next couple of albums after this. So this is as as with so much of the new thing of so much of free jazz in the late 50s and early 60s it's a fascinating piece because you can almost hear the the transition through different phases of exploration happening right on the album itself and in the individual cuts so Ornette Coleman is one of the great jazz saxophonists and he's best known for playing alto and he's also very well known for playing, as he does on this album, for playing a plastic alto, which he uh, originally purchased because he was down in his luck and, and could only afford a plastic sax and needed a sax. Decided that he liked the tone. Uh, it, it's a little, it's a little brasher. It's a little, almost sounds a little reedier to me than than a metal saxophone. I'm not totally sold on it necessarily as a sound, but. But he liked it at the time, there is an argument which he has made that its tone, its unconventional nature, sort of fit with the relatively revolutionary activity that he was engaged in in jazz. It's, it's an interesting quirk of this album and an interesting quirk of, of the early phase of Coleman's career. In terms of personnel, you've got Don Cherry on trumpet, Don Cherry who had been recruited by Coleman as a teenager and who of course to go on to his own really significant and influential career uh, as, a, as, a, as well in the free jazz movement, um, but elsewhere in jazz as well. It's got Charlie Hayden on bass, another very young guy playing with this group, and he makes a really substantial contribution to this album, which was quite revolutionary uh, for, for bass playing at the time this came out and was sort of received unevenly at the time by, by contemporary listeners. And closing out the quartet is Billy Higgins on drums, and this is Higgins' last appearance with Coleman before Ed Blackwell takes over on drums for subsequent albums. So, as I mentioned, this is free jazz, but it's but this music is still largely anchored in in hard bop uh, in, in 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 the traditions of jazz from sort of 1945 to 1960. This is not in any way sort of unmoored, untethered free jazz. The kind of even within a year or two, when he starts to record with his with his double quartet, uh, with very very few guidelines as to how the musicians were to play or 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 or, or what the elements of the piece would be, um, this is this is not yet that. This is still something with relatively short, uh, recognizably bop influenced jazz, and as such, it's one of the more accessible albums from this phase of Coleman's musical evolution. It doesn't have any standards on it. These are all original compositions. Coleman actively encourages the other players to solo and not necessarily just to sit, you know, t -t 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 -t, you know, wait while while someone else solos and then you take your turn, which of course was a standard practice in uh, in jazz quartets. Um, but to uh, but to extemporize and and innovate simultaneously, and you hear that not all the time on this album. I think, frankly, he makes more of it in the liner notes than I actually hear in the record, but there's de there definitely is something of that going on. The constraints on jazz are, are audibly being taken off as you listen to this record. Coleman, of course, is also sort of famously self-consciously aware of and promotes the, the innovation that he's coming up with. I mean, this is not exactly a um, the title of an album which is, you know, is made up by somebody who wants to hide his light under a bushel. I, you know, more power to him, I think. I, I think he, he actually did put his, uh, his, his playing where his mouth was and really did shake up the jazz world. So the album starts off with Rambling, which, is, which initially sort of seems like standard issue hard bop, except that then pretty soon you have Coleman coming in with that plastic sax tone. And, and again, that's it's a slight hint that something, something different is going on here. And maybe it's just that I associate that with freer sounds, but either way, the association is there. And then you get Hayden coming in on bass, and he's strumming the bass, which was really unconventional at the time. And he does this elsewhere in the album as well. It's a bit like brushwork is to drumming, as strumming a bass is to, is to regular, uh, regular uh, picking of, of bass lines. 
when Don Cherry's trumpet enters, it's, I find it, and actually I find this routinely the case through, through this album, because I'm not that wild about the plastic alto sound, or the tone, I should say. Cherry's trumpet is constantly a uh, really refreshing contrast to Coleman's playing. Coleman's playing is great, but the two horns are an excellent contrast to each other. Finally, the song descends to a bit of a hush, and then there's this final flourish. It's a great ending to what is a really great song and a really promising uh, way to open the album. The next song, Free, again, a highly evocative title, starts with Coleman running through what almost sound like practice scales. Uh, this is a lot less traditional a number than the opening track. Uh, it's, uh, it's got some excellent playing in it, and, and by all four contributors. But I still, this feels like a song which made more sense in its conception than maybe it does in its execution. It feels, a little, in other words, a little transitional and, and not necessarily in the best of ways here. Not my favorite cut in the record, uh, but still portends all kinds of things to come. And then the last song on side one is The Face of the Bass, which, as, it, as the name suggests, is a vehicle for Charlie Hayden. And uh, my only complaint about this is, uh, the, uh, certainly on this pressing, the bass is, sounds quite low in the mix, for which is a bit sad for a song which features the bass. That said, I'm not averse to cranking it up, and what you hear is, is a very young bass player who is already a master of his craft, creating all these different colors of, 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 of sonic textures uh, out, of, out of, you know, what is essentially a rhythm instrument. Uh, superb, and a great way to finish side one. On side two, the first song is Forerunner. Uh, you have a whole bunch of different soloing on here. You've got, uh, you've got uh, Coleman and Cherry who start off riffing side by side, and actually that's a feature which occurs uh, several places on the album as a way to both start and finish songs. It's executed really well here, and it is executed well elsewhere. Higgins has these two short solos on drums, and then, and then, uh, and then Coleman really takes flight. Uh, but for me, the real star of this song is John Cherry, uh, who just who whose talent just pours out um, of well of a number of tracks in this record, but really on this uh, on this first cut particularly. Followed by Bird Food, which is a name suggests is a bit of, a, of a, an homage to Charlie Parker. Uh, again, you get the side by side riffing between the two horns to start. This song maybe contains well, I should say first of all, it, it, it's 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 a it's a homage to. Uh, to Parker, it's not, but there's no, there's no um, sort of faithful copycatting, which kind of unfortunately was 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 a feature of a lot of sax playing uh, in the 50s. Was 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 guys uh, trying to sound just like Parker. Um, this is clearly a nod to Parker, but in no way is this is this uh, is this simple mimicry. Uh, this, this is very much Coleman's unique contribution. I think it's also maybe his more extended solo here, maybe my favorite solo of his on any album of his that I've heard. Third song on side two is Un Muy Bonita, which which again starts with this dual riffing from from Coleman and Cherry, starting to get a little repetitive, but it's still so well done you don't really mind. Um, the uh, Cherry this time is playing a mute, uh, which for a bit of a different flavor and and it pulls it off I think very effectively. It's it's. I would say one of the more traditional sounding, by which I mean a more standard kind of hard bop tune than some of the other uh, cuts on the on the record, uh, but you know none the worse for that. And and if anything, as I said, this this is a more accessible record for you know, for jazz listeners of the day, maybe even jazz listeners today than some of his later work. You get more of that fantastic strumming work from Hayden on the bass, which is which is just so interesting and so so unique to listen to. But for me, the best part of this particular track is Higgins stretching out on drums while Cherry is soloing over top. Um, that is, uh, th that's a really great moment. And then it all concludes with Change of the Century, the title track, which is, as you can imagine, uh, probably the clearest expression of the so-called new thing on this album. This is the most untethered, unrestrained, uh, free jazz on the, on the whole record. It's, it's, a, it's a trip. Coleman would go on to do greater things in that vein in future, but this really is pointing the way directionally. It's, it's hard to summarize verbally, but it is a compelling way to end this album. Rating this album, I think, has to take into account that this is part of a sequence of albums which blew apart conventional understandings of what jazz could be, pissed off the critics no end, opened the door to an incredible, 
decade of artistic ferment. And, and as my, if there's any, obviously, while no one person is responsible for all the great things that happened to jazz in the 1960s, uh, you could not make any kind of list of who is responsible for that without including Ornette Coleman on that particular list. I've said I'm not that wild about the plastic sax tone, whatever. Uh, he, again, he's got a manifesto that this is free jazz, but and yet, and, and free jazz is what these guys deliver. But at the same time, you have this sense of real unity of purpose through every single one of the tracks, not just the not just the conventional ones, but also the ones where where the, the constraints have really been lifted by the leader. If you think about where jazz goes by the late 60s, you could say this is still a little bit conventional, but that's still just picking at the seams of this. Uh, this is a really important record, and it's a great record at the same time, and I gotta give it five out of five.